All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we reach the end of this course. I want first to continue our discussion from the last few times about judging people, and this time with a specific focus, how to judge their intellectual honesty. In other words, when they come out and advocate various ideas which are wrong, are they honestly mistaken or not? Are they dishonest? That's our main topic for the first part. And then on the basis of all of our discussions of judging people, including this evening's, I want in the second part to take up the last argument from the opening lecture that I have not yet covered fully. That's the issue of philosophy versus the world, or objectivism versus people. The issue, does life have to be a constant battle, alienation, and so on? And I hope to conclude that it does not. All right, let's turn to honesty, and I want to first give you some motivation as to why I picked this topic. Uh, to, to discuss in this last lecture. In part, it's a continuation of lecture three. We discussed honesty as a virtue there. You recall we defined it as evading some fact or facts of reality combined with some form of pretense, some form of manufacturing a new fact, a new dimension uh, that the person wants to be so regardless of the actual fact. We concretize that process to some extent, and you can regard tonight's discussion as a further concretization. It's by no means always obvious uh, when a person is being honest and when he isn't. So we are like on an advanced level of chewing now, not just the easy examples, but the complex real life cases where it's not self-evident. This is like graduate school chewing. Now. In part, it's a continuation, as I said, of our last few lectures on judging people. But our discussions there were very generalized. And here I want to take one specific trait. We could have a lecture on every trait, but I want to take one and observe the kind of complexities involved in deciding just that one issue. I chose honesty because although it's not the whole question in judging people by any means, it is a very important question. It's important in helping you get to the essence of another person, and therefore in helping you to decide, do you want to deal further with this person or not? So far, of course, is you have a choice. If the guy is your boss, you may have to deal with him, even if you conclude he is intellectually dishonest. But we're speaking here of people in general. If you talk to a man, and you disagree about major issues, and you conclude that he is honest, that it's simply an honest difference in viewpoint from yours, then other things being equal, you don't write him off. You say he's merely mistaken, and you may very well decide he's a decent, good, honest person. I like other traits of his. I want to continue the relationship. As against, if you decide, this person is not merely mistaken, he is dishonest. He is an evader. He doesn't want to know. Uh, we're getting some funny feedback on the sound here. Uh, he wants to live in an unreal world, and he resents me for trying to blast him out of it. Well, if you conclude that about somebody, it makes all the difference in the world. And in that case, the appropriate conclusion would be, there's no use arguing further with him. He's not open to evidence. It's a waste of time to try to convince him. You're merely courting frustration. Plus, you are then sanctioning evil. You're letting him get away with the pretense that he's open to an honest discussion. Uh, something, whoever is doing the sound back there, will have to be done, because it's tremendous vibration and echo up here. Lee, have you heard that? So practically speaking, this is a, an important question. To judge an honest man as dishonest is unjust and leads you to give up a good man through improper condemnation. To judge a dishonest man as honest makes you a perennial victim of his dishonesty and merely sanctions and thus aids the spread of evil in the world. This issue of honesty is very important, I think, to your general view of people. If you have a tendency to snap judgment on this question, if whenever you hear disagreement, you automatically conclude, this guy is dishonest, he's a swine, he's vicious. The fact is, since you are in a very small intellectual minority, if you're an objectivist, you're going to quickly conclude, if that's your policy, that people in general are rotten and that life is miserable. And you will soon end up bitter, paralyzed, overcome with futility. 
Again, I'm trying to combat this rationalist improper condemnation and the resulting malevolence. Now, I warn you again, this whole course is slanted to combat rationalism. My emphasis tonight is going to be to attack the rationalist manifestations in regard to this topic. I'm going to say virtually nothing about the empiricist manifestations. The empiricist tendency, of course, is the opposite here. It's either not to judge at all other people or aggressively say everybody is honest, there is no such thing as immorality, everybody is really wonderful, innocent, etc. That's what you can call philosophic Pollyannaism. That's also wrong. Uh, and it's self-defeating, but it is not the typical error of objectivists I have known. In another world, I could imagine, where the whole audience was strongly over on the amoralist side, I would give a long emphasis and lecture on why there is dishonesty and merely refer peripherally to the theoretical possibility of the other. But this particular lecture is entirely slanted the other way. So Again, don't take my emphasis as meaning the right conclusion is to say nobody is dishonest. All right, when is a man being honest as against dishonest in intellectual issues? Well, we know that in general, an honest ma man conforms to the facts of reality as he grasps them. A dishonest man defies the facts that he either does grasp or easily could, if only he would look. The first thing to say, then, is if you want to describe some belief as honest, you have to be able to point to something in reality, some data, some basis that would make that conclusion possible or understandable. Of course, I hasten to say, since the belief is wrong, the reality basis is being misconstrued by the person. He's misinterpreting the evidence because his idea is false. But their point is there has to be some basis, some glimmer of fact or reason as to why the person would accept it. If there was any idea such that absolutely nothing in reality, nothing, however generous your interpretation uh, of the person, there is literally zero to suggest X or be a basis for X, then, by definition, that cannot be an honest belief. Now, this, of course, is very general and very difficult to apply concretely. Suppose a man says, God must exist, because who created the universe? Now, in fact, that is not a basis to believe in God. But he thinks there's a basis, and minds such as Thomas Aquinas, for instance, have accepted variants of that type of argument. They thought, for instance, the orderliness of the universe, the lawfulness, and so on, was evidence that there was a God. They were mistaken, but they could point to some seeming evidence. By that fact, it is therefore not necessarily dishonest. Now, this is true of most errors, that in some context you can imagine a plausible basis. But I want to say at the outset, it is not, in my opinion, true of all errors. There are some positions in which I would say, by the very nature of the viewpoint, no matter what the context or ignorance of the person, to accept that viewpoint is necessarily dishonest. As I say, there are not many such positions, but I think there are some. So I want to give you a non-exhaustive list at the outset, which will define one extreme. This, in this axis, I think you can definitely say this guy is dishonest no matter what, simply from what he says. And I'll divide up my non-exclusively exhaustive list into three main subdivisions. Inherently dishonest positions is the title. Philosophically, this would be point A, any explicit, and I underscore the word explicit, any explicit repudiation of reason and reality. In other words, the open statement, to hell with reason, down with reality. You say to the guy his argument is senseless, and he says, that's tough. I, I hold no brief with making sense. And you tell him, well, your theory conflicts with reality, and he says, there is no reality. It's a myth. Facts are whatever I want them to be, or whatever society wants them to be, etc. Honesty is the attempt to conform to reality by the use of your mind, your reason. If you openly reject these, that is, the mind and or reality, therefore, you have to be dishonest because that wipes out the whole base of honesty. 
nobody, however ignorant, can think my way of conforming to reality is to reject it. That is simply too much. That's too blatant. There can be no possible basis in reality for the idea that there isn't one. And this, by the way, is why I regard Kant as the major turning point, morally speaking, in terms of the moral status of philosophers. I believe that, in general, philosophers up to Kant were dominantly honest, albeit mistaken. Since Kant, and thanks to his influence, I think philosophers are dominantly dishonest. And the difference lies, and can be symbolized, in the difference between Plato and Kant on this point. Plato thought there was a reality. He was wrong about what it was, but he nevertheless said there is a reality and we must conform to it. And he thought that reason was essential to grasping it up to a point, even if his view of reason was distorted, and even if past that point he thought you needed a mystic insight. That is an essentially different phenomenon from reality by its nature is unknowable and beyond the capacity of our minds to grasp, which is Kant's view. And reason by its nature is an agency of distortion so that if your mind comes to a conclusion by that fact, it isn't so which is the essence of Kant's view. Kant, therefore, really inaugurated the essence of dishonesty into the mainstream of Western philosophy. And that's what I think is a major turning point as an example of this first point. Now, point B of these intrinsically dishonest positions, on the ethical or evaluative level, any explicit attack on values as such any explicit attack on values as such. Men have to live by pursuing values. Everybody does it in some form. Everybody knows it in some form. To assault values as such, to tell people they have to get rid of values as such, has to be in defiance of every solitary thing the person could possibly get from even the most fragmentary glimmer of a glance at reality. Now here I have in mind, for instance, nihilism, as exemplified, among other things, in modern art. The idea of the destruction of the various art forms as an end in itself. Not the advocacy of a new school with different values, as, for instance, naturalism versus romanticism. Both of those could be honest. But the idea of art's essence being to strip away the essential values of every single field. I, I refer you to my book uh, on that point. Uh, for elaboration. Now, I'm not saying every advocate of modern art is dishonest. I'm here talking about those who know its nihilist essence and advocate it. We'll discriminate some other types of advocate later. Another example of nihilism would be the Kantian view of sacrifice as against the Christian. Christianity said sacrifice yourself in the name of helping the weak and for an alleged higher value, which is your happiness in the next life. Kant said, sacrifice everything because it's a value, destroy for its own sake. Egalitarianism, I would take as another example of this uh, explicit attack on values as such. I'm thinking of Rawls and the idea, destroy the men who achieve values because they achieve value. Cut down the virtuous because they're virtuous. That's what Ayn Rand calls hatred of the good. And all of those would be examples that I think are intrinsically dishonest. And then finally, point C, politically. Any advocacy of the totalitarian state, whether it be Nazism or communism, not necessarily socialism, but I mean the open declaration, <clears throat> man should be a slave, he should have no right to think, to choose on any level, he should be a complete zombie, mindlessly obedient to a master, of which the extreme expression is a concentration camp. This is simply the same nihilism as point B, in other words, utter destruction now in politics, and the same reasoning applies. Now, all of these A, B, and C points I hold are absolutely devoid of any basis, even mistaken. They fly in the face of essentials that no one can escape if he gives the most casual attention to reality. They are inherently wicked, vicious, dishonest viewpoints. So I think there are some such things as dishonest viewpoints. But I say that to allay the fears of those of you who think I'm going to turn soft on morality. But I do want to say that the advocates of these type of views are a minority. 
They definitely are a minority in the world, and in the United States in particular. Mostly these views will emanate from the mouths of professional intellectuals who have been steeped in years of corruption at colleges. Ordinary people do not utter such things as a rule. So the question becomes, how do you judge the more typical cases? Where, from the nature of what the person says, he might be honest and he might not be. And here we have a much more difficult and complex question. Now, in general, the answer is you have to consider the context of the person, the cognitive context of the individual. In other words, how much evidence was available to him? Did he have accessible to him all the data you have and then evaded it, deliberately invented something to replace it? Or was his context more limited? Was his ability to grasp the truth, therefore, impaired, limited, and therefore his error does not prove dishonest? Now, how do you tell this? Well, there's a tremendous number of factors that are relevant to deciding another person's intellectual context. One obvious factor, for instance, is age. Inexperience, the limited knowledge of a young person, excuses a great deal. It mitigates a lot of intellectual senselessness that would be unforgivable in an adult. This is particularly true given the state of modern colleges. Teenagers are, by definition, ignorant. Not in the sense that they're completely devoid of knowledge, but they're just in the process of acquiring knowledge. They are, by that very fact, capable of much greater errors than an adult would be. Plus the fact that the schools and colleges have assaulted their minds systematically for a decade or more from the time they enter grade one, makes them incapable of thought for the most part, pump them full of falsehoods as the basic self-evident framework. It would take heroic independence on the part of one of these children, even to conceive how rotten his whole educational system has been. Now again, a dishonest teenager is a possibility. But I say other things being equal, you give the benefit of the doubt to someone who is young, up to a point. We, we don't have to haggle over how young is young and what age does he lose his uh, dispensation. But I would say once you're in your early 20s, you lose this excuse. Now, the context of the person also varies with the historical era that he lives in, because that determines also how much evidence is available to him. Andre and We the Living thought Russia was a noble experiment, that the grief would only last a very short time, and that uh, thereafter it would be utopia. Now, he was, of course, wrong, and Miss Rand herself thought he was a fictional character that could not have a real-life counterpart. But at least in fictional terms, it was conceivable for such a character to exist at the time of the Russian Revolution. You could not, in Russia in 1983, have someone who thinks it's just temporary and all the concentration camps don't really mean anything, not with all the facts they now have available. Or, for instance, there is a difference here, very relevant, between believing in God in the 10th century and in the 20th, in the age of modern science. Now, I don't here imply that all believers in God are dishonest, but merely that what you could say, I think, is that in the Middle Ages, virtually every believer was definitely honest. They simply could not grasp the possibility of a non-religious view of the universe at that time. Atheism was not a sin, it was just simply in, unconceived of. It was a pre-scientific culture. That's a very different context than we have today. Or context varies also with a person's profession, with his area of specialization. In certain fields, there are specialized knowledge which you either have or are supposed to have, given your field. And you can be held responsible if you don't know it. There's a big difference here, for instance, between the man on the street who reads uh, you know, in some uh, tabloid, that the world is coming to an end uh, because of the pollution and ecology, as against one of these left-wing scientists 
who come out with these doomsday scenarios in defiance of all known facts and of all scientific method in order to foster their socialist conclusions. Now, the scientists are prima facie, who do this are prima facie much more dishonest, and the individual who reads the, uh, the Enquirer or whatever may not be. Or as another example at this point, the man on the street who simply says there are no absolutes, who doesn't have the faintest idea what the philosophic implications of this is, is in a very different position from the philosopher who knows what this means and who knows that it's a complete assault by implication on reason and reality. Now, I can't list for you every factor that the context would depend on. There's a tremendous number, for instance, intelligence, plain, ordinary intelligence. You don't expect as much from somebody who's mentally retarded or who's dull or who's average going up the scale as from someone who is more brilliant, etc. So you'll have to work out in your own experience what other factors are relevant to inquire if you have doubt. Now, these factors will not yet lead you to a conclusion. They merely give you a place to start. In judging honesty, you begin by asking, given everything I know about this person, his age, his era, his field, his intelligence, etc., could he have known this point? Was there some basis in reality to lead him to what he went to, to throw him off? Or was he defying evidence that he must have seen given his cognitive context? Now, sometimes in trying to weigh this, and it's by no means easy to weigh, there are lots of cases in which I simply say I haven't the faintest idea if this person is honest or not. I just don't know. But sometimes, as I say, not always, but sometimes it's helpful to take yourself as a standard in judging this question. In the following way, if you could have once believed something honestly, then so could somebody else. So if you see someone who believes something wrong that you yourself once held, of course, that doesn't prove he's honest, because he may have a much better context now than you have. He may be more knowledgeable. But at least it shows that it's possible for him to be honest if you have no evidence to the contrary. In other words, your introspection on this point would prove it's possible in some cases for this belief to be honest. This, for instance, is one ground on which I will swear till I die that it's possible for a rationalist to be honest, because I committed that error and I regarded it as honest in my own case. Now, it does not, however, always work in reverse. If a certain error was impossible to you, it doesn't follow that it's impossible to others except for their dishonesty. It depends on whether their evidential context was as good as yours. Someone can be honestly confused or misguided about something that you are perfectly clear about. For instance, you read Atlas Shrugged, and you take some courses, etc., and to you it's now perfectly clear what's the right politics. That does not prove that everybody who disagrees with you is dishonest. To you now, disagreement on politics, say, is impossible. But that would be dropping the cognitive context of others. And this is one of the tests of a good teacher or communicator, to be able not to take your own knowledge as the sole standard to realize that honest confusion can exist, even though, to the speaker himself, perhaps, the issue was always clear. Now, let's assume that you're trying to judge the person's context, and you make the irrelevant comparison to yourself. Can I suggest any test of honesty to confirm or weaken your conclusion so far? And yes, I think there is a critical test. And that is the method by which a person argues or conducts himself in a discussion. That can be very revealing. The method by which he conducts himself in a discussion. This exists, of course, on a whole spectrum, but to take the two extremes, if a person resorts to invective, ad hominem, aggressive changes of subject, evasion of your point of view, sarcasm, name calling, name dropping, etc., that clearly suggests pretty dishonest. It looks like he's actively working to ignore reality and sustain his fantasy. Contrast that with a person who listens. He doesn't resort to personalities. He tries to answer your points, or at least he says, well, I don't know. I, I can't answer. I'll have to think it over. 
that gives you a completely different picture. Now, I want to point out that this test of method, although it's certainly helpful, is not always an absolute. I've seen a person resort to invective, evasion, etc., where you would say, this guy is a real louse. And then later, on his own, apologize. And it turns out in discussion that he was threatened by what you said. He was thrown, he reacted emotionally, he was out of control. And later he calmed down, he recognized what he had done, he admitted it to himself. Now this indicates, obviously, a better person who had a bad episode, but he wants to remain in contact uh, with reality, and he owned up to it. That is not evidence of a dishonest person. So I think you have to go by the total picture. Is this, if you see somebody writhing around in one of these uh, ways, is this a temporary attack of emotion, derailing a basically decent person, or is it evidence of a long-range commitment to dishonesty? And it's pretty easy to judge this question. How do you think you judge this? Yes. That's right. You just watch a, a pattern across time. And after a few times, if he keeps throwing a fit, he loses the excuse that this was just a temporary aberration that becomes his character. So you just look at the general pattern of his behavior. Now, I would like to point out from the other side, you can have the reverse phenomenon. I have observed professors whom I know, I don't even say hypothesize, but know are dishonest intellectually. I know that from extensive private discussions and from the nature of their views, which are beyond horrendous. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, I have seen those very same professors, not all, but some, when talking to students, engage very calmly, uh, with no invective in discussion. They are the seeming model of rationality. They answer every point of the student quietly. From everything you would look at, you would swear they are, they are honest. But the fact is that they are so trained in expounding their dishonest viewpoint that no student throws or threatens them at all. They just internally laugh at the idea of a student who thinks that he can find a chink in their armor. So they enjoy the encounter. They remain absolutely in control. They come across as calm, reasoned, honest, when in fact they know perfectly well what they're doing, and they relish the process of crippling their students under the veneer of honest discussion. So you have to know the full picture when you judge a person's method of argument. And here, the content of his views is critical. That's why I opened with views that I think are intrinsically dishonest. That's overriding. If he is an avowed Kantian or those other ones that I mentioned, he is dishonest no matter how sweet his manner. Now, let's develop this further, another point. We, when we judge a person's context, we're trying to discover what could he have grasped if he tried. Well, there's another factor relevant in answering that question besides the evidence available to him. And that is the person's psychology, especially what Ayn Rand called his psychoepistemology, his automatized methods of thinking. Honesty involves, you see, two different kinds of factors. On the one hand, the objective evidence available to the person. And on the other hand, the ability of his consciousness to take it in, to process it correctly. And this last involves his psychology. Above all, his subconscious processing mechanisms. The automatic or automatized thinking mechanisms with which he deals with the evidence. The evidence may be available to him, given his age and his profession and his field and etc., and yet his psychoepistemology may be so poor, so chaotic, that he is effectively deprived of the means to take in the evidence. So even though something would be obvious to an ordinary person, it would not necessarily be dishonest to this individual. 
Now here the arch examples are rationalists and empiricists. Now rationalism, as I say, can be a thoroughly honest error. Not all rationalists are necessarily dishonest. But once they become rationalists, they are unable to keep ideas connected to reality. They become oblivious to factual data. They start deducing consequences from floating axioms, as we've seen. And up to a point, if you know this kind of methodology is automatized in a person's mind, that is relevant in judging whether he's honest or dishonest. Take a man, for example, who advocates communism in regard to property. Communism with a small c. All property should be owned in common. And he projects in a rationalist void that if we had that kind of world, it would be a world of peaceful cooperation, some socialist utopia. Now, in actuality, what he is preaching would, it goes counter to the requirements of human life and would lead to disaster. But in his floating world, he simply shrugs off real life examples as irrelevant, as distortions of his ideal, and he simply deduces in a void. If everyone shared, then there would be no greed. If there was no greed, then everyone would love everyone. If everyone loved everyone, then there would be peace. And it's all in that other dimension, like Leibniz drawing conclusions from premises. This is profoundly mistaken, not only in content, but in method, but it is not in every instance necessarily dishonest. Or take as a, another example the empiricist, the kind who is so distrustful of abstractions that he deliberately refuses to accept a theoretical conclusion because he's suspicious of all theoretical conclusions. So for instance, you argue with him about capitalism, and every example that he brings up, every monopoly and every depression, and every alleged instance of child labor, et cetera, et cetera, you answer. And you tell him, well, do you now agree with capitalism? He's still suspicious because he has to be, by his method, suspicious of any system. As soon as you put a, quote, label, it's suspect. That's conceptualization. Who can know? Again, up to a point, he has been destroyed intellectually by his inbuilt method. And it becomes like a self-made stupidity, in his case and the rationalist case. It's like a self-made inaccessibility to facts. You see, we said intelligence was relevant. Well, rationalism and empiricism amount to a self-reduced intelligence. It's like a person has a partial lobotomy. Now, if you're young, this is theoretically curable. But if you're no longer young, you're not so flexible uh, anymore. Bad methods of thought may become incurably entrenched. In such a case, I would say the person is not necessarily dishonest, but for practical purposes, it comes out to be the same as if he were. Because it has the same result. You can no longer deal with the person. The purpose of the whole discussion is to try to determine whom to pursue and whom to abandon. Now, the extreme entrenched rationalist or empiricist in practice, even if he is honest, you have to end up treating as though he were dishonest because he is so, in the vernacular, screwed up that you can't reach him anymore, except possibly by many, many years of psychotherapy. It's as though he were psychotic. Uh, he may be very honest, but so what? What are you going to do with him? Now, I hasten to add, of course, he is not psychotic. And therefore, I must stress rationalism and empiricism, although they excuse a lot of errors, excuse in the sense that you can't claim the person is dishonest, they do not excuse everything. At a certain point, the evidence becomes so blatant that even an honest rationalist has to admit something is wrong with his viewpoint. For instance, However rationalistic a Soviet apologist, he cannot escape the facts of the Soviet system. Even his rationalism cannot literally blind him to the butchery of so many millions of people. So there you have to say, if he's not psychotic, it doesn't make any difference if he's rationalist or what, he is dishonest. And the same principle applies to an empiricist. I got a good question from someone in this class uh, when we gave that example in the empiricist lecture about the Korean plane being shot down and that empiricist professor had all these incredible concrete bound questions. And the questioner said, well, 
okay, he's an empiricist, but how can he overlook the deaths of the passengers? Why didn't that have any effect on him? And I think that is a very good point. I defer to that questioner. Even an empiricist does not become an actual moron. So however concrete bound he is, there are issues which even he cannot miss. So at a certain point, he is dishonest also. Now, there are other psychological mechanisms relevant to judging honesty besides rationalism or empiricism. I gave an example earlier about the person momentarily threatened by uh, an argument you would give who becomes hostile, de defensive, and so on. That's not necessarily an expression of a whole twisted psychology on his part. And it's relative to know in such a case, is this person being detoured? by a subconscious mechanism, an unidentified emotion that's warping his performance, or is he just plain dishonest? And here the test, of course, is his pattern of behavior across time. The only point I'm making is there may be subconscious mechanisms, unidentified defense mechanisms, etc., that temporarily warp an otherwise honest person, that detour him and throw him off the rails. That does not necessarily prove that he is essentially dishonest. Now I want to say that I am not counseling what Ayn Rand called psychologizing as a way of life. In other words, whenever anybody says anything, immediately hypothesizing what his deep subconscious psychology is and then excusing him on the grounds that nobody can help what they do because of their Oedipus complex or whatever. In judging any moral or philosophical question, including honesty, you have to go by the facts, by the philosophic content, until and unless there is some specific evidence of a psychological malfunction that obtrudes itself blatantly upon you. At that point, you can then investigate if you want to pursue the person. All I'm saying is this. You can't, on principle, say, to hell with this man's psychology. I judge his honesty strictly on the basis of the evidence available. No, you do have to, in some cases, take this into account. But you cannot use it arbitrarily to justify or, or explain away everything. You should give primacy to the conscious data and consider the subconscious only when there's something you know, really malfunctioning blatantly, like a real rationalist or something, where uh, there's no other way to interpret his conscious statements except by the idea there's something wrong with the way his mind operates. Now another point with regard to judging honesty. We're debating always, this man believes X, is he honest? Well, it's very important to know what does he take X to mean? Does it mean to him what it does to you? Does he see in it what you see. You cannot assume that everyone atta attaches identical meanings to every term or statement. To judge him, uh, to judge his belief on his part, you have to know what he takes the belief to mean. For instance, on the simplest level, a person may be guilty of a misuse of language, of a misnomer. He may be simply ignorant of the meaning of the term. So he could, for instance, a man on the street could advocate altruism, and to him, that simply means giving a dime to a beggar or helping someone in trouble and has no deeper meaning whatever. That's obviously not what's meant by altruism philosophically and is entirely different from Auguste Comte, the coiner of the term, coming forth and advocating altruism, where he means the complete, utter self-sacrifice of man to the, to the collective. This is an important general issue in judging non-philosophers who utter formulations casually with little idea of their meaning. Most people are not formulators. And by formulators, I mean people trained in or even conscious of methods of exact statement of their views. Most people have no such idea at all. They have no such concept as there is a way of expressing your philosophic or intellectual views exactly. They toss out terms or ideas casually, lightly, with no precise idea of the meaning or implications. 
and one grave error for, uh, on the part of a philosophical person judging a non-philosophical one is to assume that every utterance of his has a standing in his mind that every utterance of yours has, that every utterance of his is weighed, considered, grasped in every implication. It may be casual, unthought out. It may not even stand for a real belief in the person's part. He may be just groping something in words which the next day he wouldn't even remember that he said. So when you're judging a person, honesty in believing X, you have to first find out what does he really believe, if anything, on this question. Maybe he has no actual belief at all. Maybe he's groping to formulate a good belief and he's just a poor formulator. Now, even when a person does actually hold a bad belief, so he believes something and it's wrong, it's still very important to distinguish the implicit from the explicit. The implicit from the explicit. A belief may imply a disaster without the person knowing it. I gave the example of the man on the street. The denial of absolutes implies wiping out all of reality. But that is obviously not known to him. Or to give you a more extreme example, I could prove that if you do not advocate private ownership of roads, that implies the principle of statism, which implies that man should be a pawn of the group, which implies an assault on the integrity of the mind. But if you were to say, well, the ordinary person who believes in public roads is therefore hostile to man's mind, I mean, that would be ludicrous. Of course, as the implication of an idea becomes closer, more obvious, then it's more reasonable to believe that the person saw it, or at least should have seen it. If somebody openly advocates the all-powerful state, including government control of elections, the press, assembly, etc., in other words, not just the welfare state, but totalitarianism, he ought to see the slaughter implications, both from the theory and from the empirical data as opposed to the example I gave of the person who advocates public ownership of property but projects a peaceful, free society otherwise. And the issue here is, in such a case, the implication is more remote. The person doesn't necessarily see that if property is publicly owned, everything is destroyed. Maybe he's so rationalistic he can't see that. Now, of course, you do have an obligation to see some implication, but you don't necessarily see every implication. You see, there are many factors, therefore, to survey. The context of the person, in other words, the evidence available given his age, field, and so on. His psychology, his ability to process the data, his method of argument, the actual content of the belief he holds. What does he actually see as against what's merely implicit? And I have one last theoretical issue with regard to judging. Honesty. I think it's important to make a distinction between dependence and dishonesty. Between dependence and dishonesty. A person may be passive in regard to ideas, whether some or all. He may not have thought actively or independently. He may not even have tried to make much sense out of it but merely gone along with the social consensus, accepted the prevalent view of the culture around him. Now, I don't say this is admirable. What I am saying is I do not think this is necessarily dishonest. It does not necessarily involve deliberate evasion to sustain specific ideas. Of course, a dependent may be dishonest, depending on the reasons for his conformity. I would say, as a general rule, if a man sees the need to think about an issue and has some idea of how to go about it and then defaults, then he's dishonest because he's evading facts that he himself sees. And his motive in such a case might be laziness, parasitism, he wants a crutch, he's afraid of others, he wants to be popular, whatever, so he just shuts his mind down and goes along. Now, a lot of this is, is certainly immoral. 
uh, in the sense of it's deliberately rejecting his own mind in the name of some emotion. It requires sustained evasion, and therefore it is dishonest. But my point here is that it is possible to have a dependent who goes along with others for a different kind of reason, through helplessness. And that's particularly true in regard to philosophic issues. Most people uh, absorb ideas, philosophy, from others with no idea that what they're absorbing is controversial or that any alternative exists. They have a view of philosophy as a subject that is undealable with. It's all a matter of opinion. There are no answers. It's irrelevant to life none of which you can blame them for having given the way its advocates present the subject. Plus, even if these people accepted that the question the subject was important, they would have no clue as to how to go about thinking about it, which is itself a separate complex skill. Yet, people can't simply dismiss it the way they do nuclear astronomy or whatever because it is inescapable. So they end up conforming, accepting what they're taught, fitting in, not so much out of laziness or fear or parasitism as out of ignorance, helplessness, and not even knowing that there is an issue to think about or how to begin the process. They're caught in the position of officially believing that these issues are insignificant, and yet they can't escape, so they, in effect, half believe. Now, I think in many cases, this, is, this represents inner chaos, confusion, but not active, deliberate, dishonesty. So in other words, I distinguish two types. Let's say the dependent by commitment, who wants to be dependent, and the dependent by default, who is essentially helpless. Now, of course, there may be elements of both in a person. There can be degrees of dishonesty. Also, as far as that goes, it depends on, when you judge, you have to judge according to the salient essential feature. Is this a basically helpless person with an occasional evasion? That is still not the same as an essentially dishonest type. An occasional non-characteristic evasion is not good, but it is not damnation. Now, the dishonest types, the dependents I was talking about who are dishonest, there is not much you can do with them insofar as they are dishonest. But those who are conformists out of default are a different case. What I'm calling the helpless dependent may be a good man baffled. And that's essentially distinct from any form of dishonesty. Even the neurotic evasive dependent is not as corrupt as the actively dishonest crusader or zealot for a given idea. The typical garden variety neurotic maybe weak, lazy, etc., and therefore he is immoral to that extent. But he's not immoral in the sense of he's an essentially wicked Kantian killer. Never deal with him or sanction him. Uh, I think the proper policy in regard to such people, the, the, the weak dependence, is delimit your actions. Deal with them in the realms where they're better. And as I see it, even the weak dependent may have better areas. But the person I'm calling the dishonest advocate, the dishonest believer, uh, who's not just going along with others, but is actively evading and working to sustain uh, his uh, viewpoint, is essentially wicked, corrupt down to the roots. And that's why I think the distinction is important. To give it to you in a threefold way, what I'm calling the helpless dependent can be completely moral. The weak or neurotic dependent can be like morally a mixed economy. The real dishonest person, and this is the one we're trying to ferret out, is basically evil. And so I think there's a significant moral difference. Now, if you ask, uh, how do you tell which type you're dealing with? Well, one simple thing is, what happens to a conformist when he grasps through you the enlightenment that he has been deprived of in school? When he grasps the nature of philosophy, its importance, the way to think about it, etc. Now, if, as does happen sometimes, this guy who on the surface is just a Peter Keating, he never had a thought, he never disagreed with anybody, 
Sometimes, and I know this from personal observation, such a person wakes up, he becomes excited, he starts to think he's enamored of this whole world and he couldn't care less about the views of the majority, although prior to that point, if you had uh, followed him around, you'd say this guy is a real zero. So that would be good evidence then that he, that he was an honest person, but he just gave up. On the other hand, if when you elaborate these points about philosophy, he becomes hostile and he starts to rationalize and defend nobody can know and etc. and so on, then you can begin to hypothesize that he is the non-good type of uh, conformist. Another test here in trying to distinguish all these various subdivisions is the helpless dependent is not really deeply involved in the issue. He doesn't really hold the wrong view, typically he doesn't, as an integral, intense issue that's part of his mind, part of his soul. He mouths it, he utters it, but precisely because, you know, he's just going along, he doesn't think anybody can really prove anything, it's not a big thing to him. He's simply not challenging others, he's routinely echoing them, but he doesn't really believe it. To some extent, of course, his actions will have to be involved with his wrong belief, but it'll be minimal. That belief will be more or less peripheral to his life, where he will tend to function more by common sense. And that already is a better sign of his honesty. As against, you see, someone who would mouth the same ideas, but who's an active proselytizer, debater, lecturer, arguer, activist. Now you take, for instance, the nuclear freeze, the typical leaders, the instigators, the scientists and agitators who are out promoting that, I think are demonstrably dishonest. But the followers on the whole, I don't think you can say that. Uh, and I think one of the reasons that there's a distinction is precisely that the followers go along with what they're told and they hear 10 trillion facts and what do they know and everybody's saying it uh, and uh, uh, that's all there is as far as they see it. They're wrong. They are not heroes of independent thought, but I don't think you can say they are dishonest and that's the issue we're talking about. And some of them you can argue with. I actually had the experience once of arguing with the nuclear freeze type and he said, oh, when I gave him an argument. Uh, you know, he hadn't thought of that point and he actually said it. And if that can happen once, it's possible. <laughs> so when you say to a person, about a person, is his belief honest? The question is, well, does he have a belief in the significant sense or merely a slogan that doesn't mean too much even to him? All right, now let us briefly apply some of these distinctions briefly, to a few topics and decide, can this belief be honest? Must it be dishonest? What are the possibilities? Well, let's take modern art. A guy says to you, I like modern art. How do you assess that as in terms of honesty? Now, I said that the phenomenon, speaking of non-objective art, is intrinsically wicked. And that the nihilists who originated and passionately defended it, and I'm thinking of that whole crew I exemplify in my chapter on the culture of hatred in my book, that is absolutely dishonest and not even subject to discussion. But does it follow that every advocate of modern art is therefore dishonest? No, I don't think it does. I think there's a whole spectrum of possibilities. And you would have to talk to the person if you're interested and see where do they go and how you would classify them. Here is, for instance, just a, a, a touch of a pattern, by no means exhaustive. Well, the most innocent I could imagine would be an utterly ignorant person who uh, likes certain things that he sees on the wall from the point of view of decoration. He doesn't see any issue at all. He knows zero about art or philosophy. He just likes certain smears. They've got nice color, etc. I would say it doesn't prove anything about his dishonesty. It certainly shows he's got a lot to learn. And it might be discouraging to have to start the philosophic discussion if he's at that stage of the game. But it does not prove 
that he is necessarily dishonest. Now, I think myself that this is uncommon. This is a theoretical possibility which I'm projecting just to give you my most benevolent interpretation of the context that are possible. But most non-philosophical people are not like that, because modern art is too much for the average person. It is very unpopular. And I would say, therefore, another pattern is much more common if it's a confused, helpless, but basically honest person. And that's what you hear a statement like this. I don't know much about art. I don't like it. But of course, who knows? It's just a matter of taste. And a lot of very knowledgeable people seem to like it, so who am I to know? That's already more the typical pattern. Now, this person, to that extent, is simply, again, ignorant in a more plausible way, because there's tremendous issues involved, and he has no clue where to start. And now take a person who actually endorses it in a more significant way. He's, he really means that he likes it or he tries to mean it. Now, more likely here is fear, conformity, the desire not to offend the significant others like his teachers and classmates, uh, etc. So this is obviously not a heroic independence. This is, would be a kind of weak dependence. But uh, so long as the guy takes it as it's not a big issue, he merely echoes, he's not really involved, it falls in that category of standard dependence. Now take, for instance, I'm going in the spectrum of getting worse and worse, as I hope you can see. Um, <laughs> take a con man, a conscious con man, who does not like it, but actively pretends to. He's a real out-and-out -out hypocrite. In order to gain favor or prestige or a following or money or whatever. This is a real plain ordinary fraud, like a bank robber. Now, this is much more uh, dishonest, because this guy is going directly counter to something that uh, he knows. Or take, and I'm getting worse again, the type we could describe as the pretentious New Yorker. <laughs> this is not you know, just the standard uh, dependent that you would find in Iowa or whatever. But uh, the guy who wants to be a part of the elite, who is pretentious means he's pretending, but he's pretending to himself that he likes it. He's being tremendously phony. See, he's lying to himself. The con man just lies to others. So to that extent, he preserves some tie to reality. But this uh, phony uh, wants to be an elite, and therefore he masks his own actual attitude toward the thing. It's much more dishonest than any of the preceding. And yet even that is not comparable. It's benign compared to uh, the nihilists like Kandinsky and Schoenberg, et cetera, who inaugurated all. And you see, there's a whole spectrum. I personally draw the line at the con man. Further than that, I think there's no use talking or sanctioning them. But up to that point, if you want to, including even the conformist out of fear, if he's open to discussion, I, I can see talking. And sometimes it has an effect, sometimes not. Now, in this once over lightly, let's take a quick look at religion. Can religion be honest, the belief in God? Well, obviously, there are tremendously different answers that you would give depending upon where in the religious hierarchy you look. This is the issue of the context, what you expect them to know, how it stands in their minds. If I look at the top leader of some religion, such as the pope, for instance, or then next to that, taking from a Catholic example, the priesthood or the nuns, etc., or then all the way down uh, the layman, that's a very relevant thing to try to decide how much do they know about its meaning, about what it involves? How much do they have to go against their knowledge? So much in judging honesty depends upon what a person sees. It's dishonest to deny the knowledge available to you if you realize that the position uh, involves that. To judge this 
a relevant fact would be to say how much of a factor is religion in a man's life? How much of a factor is it actually? Now almost nobody is religious today in the way it was once the rule to be. The whole West in the medieval period was tremendously religious. And today the most religious zealot in the United States would have been drummed out in the Middle Ages because he would be hopelessly tainted with secularism. So religion is a, is a dying phenomenon, and I, I must confess I feel a certain sympathy or sorrow, not sorrow, but like I feel sorry for a way that these people are historically on the way out. Religion is fading all the time, so you know it's not that big a factor in most people's lives. It's a casual utterance, which they don't really act on. Although in some people, absolutely, it's a real factor. They propagandize for it, they act on it, they're zealous about it. That, of course, makes a big difference. I would make that much more dishonest in that second case. For most people, I do believe, even today, it can be honest. I think usually, in my experience certainly, religious people are intellectually dependent. They're not typically innovators. They don't have philosophic independence. But they think, at least most of the ones I've met, that there is some kind of reason you can give to believe in God. Uh, for instance, a perfectly standard thing is, well, there has to be a God because where did the whole universe come from? Where did the material world come from? Now, this is you know, the primacy of consciousness, so deeply entrenched that they just take it as self-evident that if there's matter, there must be a consciousness that created it. There has to be. There's no other thing that they can any longer seemingly conceive. And from their point of view, I have argued with some of these people long enough to be convinced. They truly can't get the point. So they are not being dishonest, whether it's a bad psychoepistemological method or they have an entrenched wrong metaphysics that it would take six years to correct. Maybe it's worthless to argue with them any further, but I do not think in many cases that is dishonest. In the same way, some people can certainly believe that, quote, some sacrifice is necessary with no idea of uh, what the whole issue is. Now I would say, if you take the typical American on the street and sat him down, unfortunately it would take about 10 hours. But you sat him down for 10 hours and you beamed at him the message, it's America or religion, that's the choice. I do think they would give up religion in favor of Americanism. And it's that which makes me think that basically they're honest. Only, practically speaking, we won't never get to have that test, so uh, you can't really apply it. But I, I do think it indicates the basic orientation of religious people in this country. Now, if we were in Iran, and you ask me, do believers in, why do I think of believers in God? It would be entirely reversed. I'd say, well, it's possible you could find some honest ones, I guess, but I never have. <clears throat> it's very important also, again, that we take into account what do people take religion to mean? Now, many people equate religion with morality as such. They think that the alternative, that the only alternative to religion is rejecting all moral standards. Now, this is certainly not evidence of dishonesty, but of confusion. And sometimes when you meet such a person, if you point out to them you know, they, that there is such a thing as a rational ethics, they change. That's very, very different in terms of its psychology from a person who equates religion deliberately with supernaturalism as such, who wants to escape from reality, who says, I hate this idea of science in this world, another dimension, and that whole real medievalist is a different order of things when you're talking about dishonesty. Now a couple of words on one last example. Uh, with regard to honesty. The believer in the welfare state, in effect, in today's status quo. Here again, it really depends what does he believe in, how much, why, what does he know, etc. For instance, if he believes in it the way Karl Marx believed in it in the Communist Manifesto, as a deliberately calculated step on the road to complete totalitarianism, that's obviously outside the realm of honesty. That's not the same phenomenon as a general dependent who 
This is the way politics has always been, as far as he knows. He doesn't know anything about the subject. It's, he's never had an idea in politics, and he just goes along. In general, I would say, you cannot condemn a welfare statist as dishonest per se. It depends on how strong is his conviction, what kind of and method of argument does he use, is he open to argument, and is he even clear what is involved? For instance, uh, in the McGovern election, I met many people who were for McGovern uh, on the grounds of the war in Vietnam which he packaged deals with an expansion, ending the war, he packaged deals with an expansion of the welfare state, and they just simply went along with it. Now, that gave me a glimmer. Now, this isn't true of all McGovern supporters, but it was of some. And it gave me a glimmer of a possibility to say that to what does the person actually see it to me? It's also important, how intent is the person on the welfare state? The typically apolitical person doesn't really care. That's very different from the kind who is intense, steamed up, who is zealously out to cut down the rich in the name of, quote, social justice. The type who wants to just help out the weak a little is very different from the type who really wants to enslave and for whom the welfare state is just a means of nihilism. You also have to take into account that the schools for 50 years have never even given people in the country the idea that there is an alternative anymore. And that context is very relevant. A welfare statist in the 19th century in America is an entirely different phenomenon than a welfare statist in the 20th century, where he doesn't even remember that there ever was anything different. I'll sum up my own view on these questions as follows. Until a person has heard the argument on the issue of the welfare state, I tend to give him other things being equal the benefit of the doubt. On the whole, with knowing all the details and contextual factors that apply, I am a priori suspicious of someone who advocates modern art and open on the question of religion and politics until I see how it stands in their exact situation and uh, mind. Now that gives you just a clue as to how we can apply some of these distinctions. Let's now take a break. Thank you. Now I want to turn to the last of the three arguments against philosophy that I mentioned in the opening lecture of this course. Philosophy versus the world. The idea that philosophy brings you into perpetual conflict with the outside world or other people. That it leads to an attitude of perpetual condemnation, malevolence, bitterness. This is the view that life is a kind of grim pilgrimage through an alien realm, where the rule should be tight-lipped tight solemnity in the presence of evil. Now this is a typically religious attitude toward life. The idea this world is a realm of sinners. It's wrong if you enjoy it. You should be alienated and await heaven. Now there are some sincere and honest objectivists who have a similar idea, but they substitute Atlantis for heaven. And they have the idea that someday, maybe centuries from now, we'll have Atlantis and happiness. But here and now, in their life, People are rotten. There is no hope. Enjoyment of the world is treason. Suffering is one's destiny. Now this would be a very understandable and even valid attitude if you were living in a concentration camp or a totalitarian dictatorship. But it is not true of life in a free or even semi-free Western country. If we're talking about the United States today, the situation is mixed. There is evil and there's good. And your reaction should reflect the mixture and not merely the negatives. So I want to say at the outset that there is good today. There is enough good today in the world, in the United States particularly, but also in Europe, there's enough achievement, enough freedom, enough justice, enough talent, enough virtue 
so that any monolithic across-the-board condemnation of society, of the culture, of the people around you is simply unjustified. Of course, there is also the bad. There's enough government regulation, injustice, dishonesty, stupidity, parasitism, unreason and mediocrity, so that a monolithic praising of everything around you would be utterly senseless and unjustified. Neither misanthropy, that is hating everyone, nor Pollyannaism, loving everyone, is justified. The first condemns all men as rotten. And if that were true, even a semi-free country couldn't exist. The second, the Pollyanna viewpoint says, all of us are really good down deep. We're really honest, moral. If this were true of everyone, including the leaders of the world, the state of the world would be inexplicable. No one could make that big a mistake. Both these warped characterizations are wrong. So the philosophic issue is how to get a balanced, rational appraisal of people, the culture, the world. Now, in answering the argument I gave you originally, I am not going to say, I am not going to say that any conflict you might have with the world is entirely a result of philosophic error. Now, in regard to the argument about philosophy versus the self, I did say that. If, assuming yourself is not identified with irrational principles, but leaving out that possibility, there is no reason whatever to have a conflict between philosophy and yourself. If you have such a conflict, it entirely comes from errors. But that is not true of the present case. I think we have a mixed issue in this case. A sense of alienation from the world can have two sources. Given the state of today's world, part of it, I think, is valid and understandable. There are some battles you cannot avoid if you hold a philosophy, given the state of the culture. But I say there are some battles you can and should avoid. So in other words, there are two different streams feeding this one conclusion of alienation. Partly it's a philosophic error that leads to this, partly not. And first I want to look at the error side of it. What kind of error would lead people to exaggerate the evil in the world, to focus only on the negative, the corrupt, the irrational? Now, Dr. Parker last week gave some psychological causes. I'm going to speak only philosophically and single out one crucial error, which of course has run through this whole course. The mind-body dichotomy with all its ramifications. The mind-body dichotomy, as we've seen, leads straight to the moral versus practical dichotomy. The moral on this view comes out as the inner, the standards within your own mind, your own integrity. But that realm is regarded as necessarily in conflict with the outer, with the world, with people, with what succeeds. So if you choose the moral side of this dichotomy, as objectivists typically do if they're going to commit the error, they have the resulting feeling, my idealism is just my standard. That's just my inner world. But in the world of other people, my standards have no power, no efficacy. They're going to be rejected. I will be impractical. And you see, this is simply another form of the same dichotomy that makes rationalists fear empirical facts and ignore them, or fear emotions and try to wipe them out. And here the parallel is the person fears other people as the element he can't control, the element that does not adhere to his inner standards that will defeat him unless he, in effect, brushes them aside, gives up relations with them, and commits himself to a solitary existence. I'd summarize it this way. The corollary of the rationalist in thought and the repressor in feeling is the misanthrope in relation to people. And it's three forms of the same basic mind-body dichotomy. The rationalist in thought, the repressor in feeling, the misanthrope in relation to people. It's all the same error in different versions and applications. 
Now, once this basic mind-body dichotomy is implanted in a person's soul, it tends to become a self-fulfilling prophecy, because it makes a person act in ways that make him think his basic viewpoint is ever more true. For instance, in pattern, first he decides on philosophic grounds, on the mind-body grounds, that you can't deal with other people. They're not like him, they'll never share his standards or admire him, etc. Then as a result of this view, he withdraws in action, he keeps his distance, he rarely if ever tries to make friends, and the result in actual fact is nobody does know or like him. And in fact, he can't deal with others because he never really tried. And so after a while, it isn't just theoretical philosophy to him anymore. It seems to him that his actual experience bears out his viewpoint, you see, his actual experience with people. And yet his experience was caused and warped by the underlying mind-body dichotomy. There are many different ways in which that dichotomy, once you get it in, is like a weed that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Here's another method. For instance, first you, you advocate the mind-body dichotomy, or you're brought up with it, and you take the rationalist path. And this leads you, by a route we've seen many times, to over-condemnation of others. You have no method of judging them, so you latch on to utterances out of context, you condemn them as vicious and dishonest, that's your characteristic method of judging. Well, after a while, and not too long a while on this policy, you have to come to feel everybody I actually meet and deal with is irrational. They're all unjust, they're all dishonest, and then you think, you see, I was right to distrust everybody. And yet, in fact, you were wrong because the overcondemnation was a warped byproduct of the mind-body dichotomy, which then worked to make it seem even more true. Now, I don't say this is the only issue involved, but I would go this far as to, to say that if you have the right attitude on the mind-body question, including above all that you are not rationalistic, you would find any problem that you have with people lightened in a major way. Not necessarily entirely gone, but certainly lightened in a major way. Because there is definitely more good out there than the rationalists imagine, and a person would be open to discover it. Parenthetically, just to keep the record clear, I must add, there is also more evil than the amoralists imagine, but that is not my theme. Tonight, close parenthesis. But I come back to the point that most people and most cultural products today are mixed. Am I saying there are no black and white only gray? Absolutely not. There is a tremendous amount of black. The Museum of Modern Art, or Washington, D.C. are two outstanding examples. But there's also a tremendous amount of weight, of good, honest people and achievements in a whole variety of realms. But my point now is typically what we are confronted with is a mixture, reflecting, reflecting the mixture of basic premises in the world today. And if you judge in a non-warped way, you should discriminate both elements. Am I saying I have to make these corrections because otherwise I get letters in perpetuity. Am I saying you should look for the good in everyone? No, because it's not always there. But sometimes it is. And then you should try to be objective, find it, notice it. When you see a mixture, it's always complicated. But you have to try to judge as well as possible what kind of a mixture. And to give you three rough possibilities, it's dominantly bad with a few fragments of something better. In that case, I would say, OK, condemn it, because that would be its essence. Recognizing that there's some better elements, but dominantly in an essence, out. Is it dominantly good, with some traces of error? Well, then again, say, OK, I think this is good, and I recognize these flaws. Is it, as a third possibility, absolutely mixed, with big errors or evils and big virtues? It being a person, a book, whatever then you have to observe and recognize that and be content with it's mixed as your final verdict. 
In other words, you can't conclude that because something is really irreducibly mixed, it does not come out as really good or really bad, but really mixed, you cannot make that automatically let you decide, therefore it's evil. It is not true that if it isn't essentially good, it has to be essentially evil, because a tremendous number of things are just essentially mixtures, unquantifiable. Now let me take that movie that I mentioned, E.T., in the opening lecture. Now, that was a movie, I think you could make a case, that it has real philosophic and aesthetic flaws. It was certainly anti-adult. In fact, it was banned in some incredible Scandinavian country because they thought it would foster a bad attitude toward adults. <laughs> That's true, where was it, Sweden? Or, yeah, wouldn't you know the welfare state? Um, <laughs> it, it's, it was anti-science in a very senseless way. It was that standard uh, science fiction type of movie which is based on science and spends its time condemning science. There were scenes which to me were certainly not fully clear. I had to ask my wife, I know how many times, what did that mean? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I think you could make a case that substantial criticism, I'm just sketching in the idea, was certainly appropriate. But for all of that, I think there was some actually enchanting things in that movie also. I found E.T. himself to be extremely likable. And I took the whole thing as a love story between E.T. and the boy, sort of like Romeo and Juliet, star-crossed lovers who have to fight the world uh, you know, to preserve their love. And this time it had a happy ending. And I think there were many brilliant, if not always entirely clear, elements and touches in it. For instance, that uh, scene when E.T. drinks and the boy in school gets drunk, which symbolizes, as I took it, or had it explained to me anyway, <laughs> uh, the emotional bond between the two, the idea being the emotional intimacy between true lovers when one is hurt, the other feels it, and so on. Now, I'm not going to go on at length on this movie. <laughs> But the thing is, it was ingenious, enjoyable. I certainly found it moving. I was in tears uh, at the end of that movie. But I did not come out saying, Spielberg is the new objectivist director. <laughs> now, I think within limits, this is a perfect case where you, an optional reaction. You could be put off by certain things and say, I just can't take a movie like that. or uh, you can pick the, the uh, better side and say, well, that was so enjoyable and so good, I'm going to just ignore the stupid message. What I do say is, it is wrong to come out of a movie like that and say, another sign of today's evil world. Now, now of course, I'm not saying every movie and every person has got the hidden good qualities you should ferret out. But I am saying in many cases of movies and books and people, etc., where there may be a tendency to condemn them across the board, the person is not judging the total. He's seizing out of context some actual negatives in the rationalist manner. And this contributes profoundly to uh, reinforcing a malevolent view of life. Now, the problem of life as a bitter struggle against an alien world is compounded by many other factors beyond just the mind-body issue. And I want to mention one briefly. And that is a peculiar interpretation that objectivists sometimes place on the principle, you must not sanction evil. Now, I've met uh, people who interpret this to mean you are obliged morally, in order to be true to your values and so on, to have a perpetual fight with everyone on everything. To get into a bitter argument at the drop of a hat with your boss, your professor, whoever. And if that's how you interpret it, it would certainly contribute to the sense, my life is nothing but a fight, a constant war against the world. Now I would like to say that this concept, this interpretation of the principle that you should not sanction evil, represents a major confusion. I think that is taking the idea of not sanctioning evil as an intrinsicist dogma out of context 
And yet the context is critical, because that principle does only applies in specific situations. You have to know in what is the exact situation. What is the evil or the alleged evil in question? What is your position in relation to the perpetrator? Does your silence necessarily mean that you endorse what he is saying, etc.? Now, we could have, I venture to say, a whole lecture or more simply on what does this principle, you shouldn't sanction evil, consist of? How do you validate it and how do you apply it? We can't give a lecture to that, but we, I want to point out this much. Ethics tells us only, do not help out evil, whether actively or passively, because that will redound to your own long-range harm. The evil is the anti-life. But you have to know, in each context, what is the evil and what would a sanction consist of. Now let's take a couple of examples. One questioner wrote me earlier in the course, I have felt guilty for years because I didn't jump up and vehemently oppose my boss's irrationalism. Let me just. Now, I don't know this person's uh, particular context, but I do want to say that typically, if it's a standard situation, you are not responsible for your boss's views. You were not hired to correct him or tutor him philosophically. You're not obligated to tell your boss what you think of his opinions. There is no objective implication, if you work for a man, that you agree with everything about him except what you explicitly denounce. An employee is not the same as a friend. And it's not a relationship of equals. It's very simple. You are there to do what he says in exchange for money. Now, there is nothing in that context to imply that you condone his private views. Of course, I could imagine contexts where even an employee should speak up. So I'm not saying there's a now a new objectivist dogma, thou shalt never speak up in the office. <laughs> For example, suppose your boss explicitly asks you your opinion in a context where you think he really wants to know, and you have reason to believe from his past conduct and so on that he would be fair, he wouldn't penalize you for it then I would say, yes, you should tell him. Not necessarily in the form of a pent-up tirade, <laughs> but calmly and briefly. Or, suppose your boss's irrationalism, as this questioner put it, necessitates you personally doing evil work, work that benefits some real provable evil. For instance, your work actually consists of benefiting Soviet Russia then you should certainly be concerned and refuse. And you should speak up and quit if necessary. But if it's the standard type of case, your silence does not objectively imply anything about your viewpoint, and there's no onus on you to volunteer your criticisms in that context. By the way, a decent boss, as anybody who has ever employed people knows, a decent boss realizes that there are a lot of controversial issues, that he is in a powerful position in relation to his employees, and he does not go around spouting off controversial views in front of helpless employees. That actually amounts to power lust on his part. And it simply, in my opinion, disqualifies him from even deserving to hear your views. You could simply be contemptuous of a boss like that and say to hell with him. Now, let me take a different situation. I'm taking an example simply because there's no time to give a whole long song and dance lecture, but just to try to give some content to this. You're in college. <clears throat> Should you let the professor in the class know that you disagree every time you do? Is your silence a sanction of evil? Well, if it is, I have certainly sanctioned a tremendous amount of evil in my 14 years as a college student. So I have to come out as the world's greatest monster next to Kant. <laughs> now I'll tell you what my policy was when I was there. Sometimes I spoke up and sometimes I didn't. According to a whole constellation of factors. 
I realized that I couldn't speak up every time because I disagreed with everything. <laughs> and since it was philosophy, every disagreement was vital. So I would have had to have equal time with the professor and the rest of the class, which would be ludicrous. So I simply had to accept from the outset an awful lot is going to go by that is irrational, horrendous, depraved, and I will be completely silent about it. I have no choice about that. On the other hand, I did not simply say, I'm going to just keep quiet and never speak up at all, because there were various specific purposes that I wanted to achieve by means of occasional raids or forays. <laughs> is there anybody better in this class? for one or for another. Periodically, I felt I have to let this professor know that there is some opposition out there. He can't assume it's absolutely safe and uncontroversial to utter all that garbage. Uh, and partly, every once in a while, I was overcome with what you could call a sheer need of self-assertion. It was just simply the feeling at times, even if it doesn't accomplish anything, I'm going to go crazy if I don't say something about this particular insanity. Now, how did I decide when to speak up? Well, it was all a matter of context. How important was the issue? How difficult is it to say anything briefly? You have to remember that in a college class, you get two sentences, and the professor gets a 10-minute speech. So that already eliminates a lot of issues. There's no use if you can't even begin to make a dent on a viewpoint. Another question I asked is, how well do I know the issue? Why should I pick an issue that I don't know very well? Since I have to let a tremendous amount go by anyway, why stumble and make an idiot of myself? I may as well pick the spot where I really know the topic. How big is the class? Because if you're in one of those huge lecture sections with 200, it wouldn't mean a thing, whatever the professor says. I mean, you're just like a dot in, a, in a, the beach there, in this, a dot of sand. If it's a seminar of three or six or ten people, there's much more implication in that context that your silence means agreement. The professor looks you right in the eye, and he smiles when he says, we know that you know, nothing exists but Campbell's soup or whatever. <laughs> so there, you know, you're almost forced to shake your head and say no. <laughs> Am I going to be graded down? Some professors, rarely, but sometimes I found professors graded you down. Therefore, I kept quiet. Most professors didn't, but sometimes. And another factor, how strong did I feel on a particular day? Did I feel able to take another assault from the professor in the class? Or was I just too tired or depressed or fed up? In other words, I picked my spots, not scientifically, but by a whole set of criteria such as this. Now and then I would speak up. Much of the time I kept silent. And I do not regard that as a sanction of evil. And I would, could certainly, speaking for myself, not have survived 14 years of college if every moment had to be total war against every utterance. Now, if you take a party, for instance, among equals, as opposed to a professor employee, a, a professor student or boss worker situation, there, it's more plausible if someone says something that you disagree with that you will want to speak up. But even here, there are limits. You don't have to contest everything. You have to decide, is this guy worth speaking to? Is there anybody who's going to listen to me? Is this an appropriate forum? There's also an optional element. Some people don't like arguing, and they have every right in the world not to. And other people just can't wait to start arguing. So they would rather argue. There's always there the possibility, you know, which has tremendous charm of saying to someone in a perfectly amiable way, I disagree with that, but this is hardly the place to go into it, and that's it. You don't have to say any more than that. In other words, there is certainly such a thing as improperly sanctioning evil, remaining silent when you should speak up. But it is a contextual issue. I, I would like to have couple extra lectures to reduce this whole topic to principles and to go at it the way we went after uh, honesty in an organized, systematized way. We can't, but I simply 
want to contest the idea that justice requires you to go around denouncing every statement that you disagree with. Often you just have to shrug them off and go about your life, and that is perfectly moral, and then it's self-preservation to do so. Even in college, which is the worst situation I can imagine, life is not a constant uh, battle. All right, now let me say a few words about the other side. In other words, I have been looking at some errors which make people feel that life is hell, people are rotten, existence is a constant battle. Now I want to look at the other side, the aspect where it is understandable if you feel isolated, to some extent and in some context. It's true after all is said and done that there is a lot of corruption in the world, a lot of irrationality and injustice. And if you're rational, you simply can't avoid seeing it, judging it, reacting to it. Even if you are absolutely non-rationalistic, you're not a condemner on principle, you're benevolent, you're predisposed to look for positives, etc., sometimes they are not there. And you get a full, concentrated dose of evil or entrenched mediocrity, where it would be simply absurd to say, look on the bright side. Now this idea that I call Pollyannism, that everyone is moral, everything is terrific, the world is wonderful, you know, in that cross-the-board way, is a complete default of moral judgment and is self-defeating. You lose the ability of self-protection from evil by that method. You become a pawn of anyone and everyone because you have no means to judge. And of course, in addition, this Pollyanna idea is tremendously unjust. The symbol of it is Joel Sutton in the Fountainhead, who loves everybody equally. Sometimes I think you have to expect to be overcome, momentarily at least, with the sheer force of the evil in a given situation. Now, I want to speak for myself from this point on, from my own experience, because I'm not exactly prepared to make a universal law out of this, so I offer this to you for what it's worth. There are times and situations where Despite my knowledge of philosophy, I feel overwhelmed by the evil in the world. I feel isolated, alienated, lonely, bitter, malevolent. And this is, to me, inescapable at times in certain contexts. I'll give you an example. I went to a debate a few weeks ago at a large university. I didn't take part, but a friend did was on the subject of the nuclear freeze, and my friend was eloquent, but it was a hopeless situation. It was an audience of college students. They were closed, irrational, hostile, dishonest by every criterion outlined tonight. They wouldn't listen for a moment. They were rude. They were real modern hooligans. And when they did speak up, it was utterly without redeeming features. A whole array of out-of-context questions, sarcasm, disintegrated concrete. It was a real modern spectacle in the worst sense of the term. Now, after a couple of hours of this, I was reacting. I was angry. I was resentful. I was hostile. And I felt, I underscore the word felt, I felt, I felt. This is the way the world is. What is the point of fighting it? They don't want to know, I'm going to retire and stop lecturing and let the whole thing blow up and to hell with it. In other words, I was depressed. I, I really was. And of course, once I was in that mood, I was more negative about everything. So when I saw the headlines in the Times the next day, I felt worse. I thought, you see, that confirms when if I disagreed with people, even the long lines at the bank were further evidence that the world is rotten. <laughs> Now, the point here is, I don't think that this is a mistake. I think you have to react to concretes. You would be schizophrenic if, after such a blatant, protracted display of injustice and irrationality, 
if you could blithely shrug it off and say, well, what the hell, life is great, everything is wonderful, I'm happy. And it has to affect you. That's the concrete reality that's been surrounding you. It has to, I think, make you miserable, depressed, malevolent, to an extent and for a time. You just can't get away always from the rotten things. And that's what I think is the valid point in the issue of philosophy versus the world. There's going to be periodic attacks, let's say, of despair, call it that. The point is what to do about these attacks. And in effect, I say three things. First, recognize them as natural unavoidable, legitimate, assuming that they really were provoked and it's not a rationalist uh, construct that you manufacture. If you take ideas seriously in today's world, I think you have to allow yourself to feel that sometimes. Certainly Ayn Rand did, as I can testify from personal experience. The character of Dominique in The Fountainhead, she has described as herself in a bad mood. And she knew that mood intimately. And if you read the forthcoming uh, book, The Early Ayn Rand, she wrote an entire play based on the premise that the world is rotten and people are awful. And she did not change, she didn't come up with a benevolent statement at the end. It was uh, uh, malevolent in that way from beginning to end. She wrote this uh, in the early 30s at a time when we the Living, her first novel, had been rejected by I don't know how many publishers. The Night of January 16th had been rejected. Her money was running out, and she simply felt there's no way to break through. People are hopeless. And in that mood, she wrote, in effect, exactly the kind of play that Dominique would have written if Dominique were a playwright. It's a beautiful, very bitter play. It's called Ideal, and you can see it. Uh, you can read it when it comes out. The point is simply this. I do not think you can escape uh, that kind of mood if you do take uh, ideas and values seriously, sometimes. Secondly, I would say you should try to minimize the occasions for them. Now sometimes there's nothing you can do. You have to live in the world and you just can't hide from what's going on. But sometimes you can. For instance, if you know that a party is going to be full of particularly disgusting people, <laughs> why go? If you know that a movie is going to turn your stomach, avoid it, unless there's some overriding reason. Now, I don't say avoid every negative. But I also say you don't have to seek out situations where you know you're going to be revolted. Do it only if you think you're going to gain more than you lose. Every one of those occasions is like an assault on your sense of life, on your benevolence. And so you have to be able to gain enough to make it worthwhile. And that brings me to the third point. What to do with these attacks of despair? I would say you have to, at, cer at a certain point, estimate the situation appropriately in the full context of your knowledge. Estimate the situation appropriately in the full context of your knowledge. Let yourself feel the bitterness, whatever, for a while. Not too short a time, either. Otherwise, you will repress it. You know, if you just feel bitter for three minutes and say, well, I know it's a wonderful world, etc., that is just a formula for repression. You have to feel it. You have to let the knife twist. You have to say, it's a rotten world. I can't stand it. Let it out. On the other hand, not to the point where it becomes self-indulgence. At an appropriate point, you have to, at, when you felt it and it's real to you, you have to start reminding yourself of what you know about life and the world and philosophy. That won't remove the evil, but it will reestablish the broader context and your overall perspective. For instance, on that debate, at a certain point, I had to tell myself, well, New York City is really worse than a lot of places in this country. And college kids are not typical of other groups. If they were, they couldn't survive. They're especially brainwashed and so on. 
and it's ideas that are really at the root that's causing them. So there's still a chance by combating those ideas. And if I give up, I'm letting the professors that I hate have the last word. And after all, there were some better people at that debate and are focused on a few things that weren't so bad, etc. Now, if you say this too soon, this type of thing, it's mechanical and it doesn't strike you. But at some point, you have to start. And I think here, if I can be personal, if you have a wife like mine, like Cynthia, you have an invaluable asset because she knows just the right amount of moaning <laughs> to permit me. And then she very gradually and unobtrusively comes in with a few questions that start to break the negative mold and restore perspective. So for instance, she asked me at a certain point after I was denouncing this whole thing back and forth for about an hour and a half. She asked me straightforward, do you think these kids are typical of Americans? So I was sort of reluctant. <laughs> but I <laughs> had to say no and begin to revive a better viewpoint. And ideally, this is one of the crucial helps that a partner in life can be to you to help you restore your benevolence and perspective after a vicious assault. And I, I certainly know that Frank O'Connor was that to, uh, to his wife and vice versa. A mixed culture like a mixed person is very, very hard to deal with. In regard to a person, you all know that there's a constant drive to simplify. You want to say he's a saint or he's a vicious. Either way, it's clear cut. It's dealable with. But when you have to say about somebody, well, he's really good in part and he's really bad in part, and I don't know what's coming tomorrow, it's very unsettling. And so there's a constant tendency to swing from one assessment to the opposite. And the same is true with regard to today's culture. It's a mixture. One day you see the best side, you feel uplifted, you experience people are great. And one day you see the vicious side and you feel life is hell and the world has gone to pot. Some oscillation I think is unavoidable, but both of the extremes are wrong. The trick is to try not to oscillate too much. And the method as far as I know is to use your conscious knowledge in conjunction with your feelings. So we come back to the reason and emotion union. When you're uplifted, you can say, fine, I love this moment. And you can even say, this is life as it should be. This is the real essence of life. But somewhere, not to diminish your enjoyment, but somewhere within you, you have to know it's not going to all be like this. And vice versa, when you are blackly in despair, you say, OK, although I know the better side will exist also. Now, that brings me to my final point of the course. I think your greatest ally in keeping a balance, a sanity in your viewpoint, should be philosophy, and specifically, objectivism. And still more specifically, the mind-body integration with all of its corollaries, including chewed, concretized abstractions. Because if that's how you hold philosophy, it should be an enormous value in helping you to judge people and events accurately. If your principles are chewed, they're concretized, you should be able to see them everywhere. And that will make the world seem better to you, more understandable you will then really see that following your principles in the long run leads to success or happiness. And you'll see that in the long run, evil really is impotent. Or put it another way, you'll see that the moral is the practical, and reality will seem much better to you. It will seem to be basically on your side, which it is if you have a true philosophy. Philosophy, and particularly objectivism, is supposed to be an aid in life. And if it's chewed and concretized, that is how it functions. And that's the main reason why I wanted to give this course on understanding objectivism. 
Objectivism should help you to enjoy life. It should help to make you glad that you're alive. And that is my sincere wish for you. Don't make objectivism into a hair shirt. In other words, a constant source of guilt, repression, condemnation, and gloom. Make it a means of your rational self-interest in the full sense. Make, let it make you happier, not more miserable, because that is its purpose. And I, I wish you success in attaining it. I, I hope this course has been of some help uh, in this regard. I want to thank you for being so intelligent and responsive an audience. As far as the formal presentation is concerned, we're finished. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have, again, a tremendous number of questions. Um, I'll handle the ones that I think are of most general interest. If I did not answer your question, I've, there's a whole pile there that I've carried around for I don't know how long. But it constantly got deferred till the next week, and this is it. So it is an issue of time only in many cases. I had a question some weeks back. Can you say that to the extent a person is irrational and holds beliefs not based on reason, that he is dishonest? Well, officially, yes. But the question is, how would you know he is being irrational? Irrational does not mean the same as simply wrong or mistaken. Irrational means deliberately rejecting reason. In other words, deliberately defying reality, etc., which would involve dishonesty. So the question becomes, yes, as soon as you know a man is being irrational in that definition, you know he's being dishonest. But what are the criteria? And that reverts back to the whole lecture. How do you decide whether he was evading or not? But you cannot simply do it if the question implies, if his viewpoint is wrong, he must be irrational in the sense of evasive, that doesn't fall. Another question from some weeks back on honesty that I saved. Can some people be low enough in their cognitive development owing to bad upbringing or environment so that you can't criticize them for being dishonest because they remain intellectually not convinced? Do you get that? In other words, they haven't had this whole course on philosophic methodology. They haven't had all the proofs of honesty. So can you say, well, maybe you can't blame them uh, for being dishonest? No, that does not follow. There's a lot of things a person can be legitimately confused about. He can even be confused about when to be honest with other people. He may have all sorts of chaotic views about other people how to deal with them, when can he trust them, should he tell the truth. For this, he may need a very lengthy clarification. But what we were talking about tonight, and what is the basic honesty, is honesty with oneself. Does the person lie to himself? Does he pretend to himself and for himself? Does he defy reality in and of and for himself? And I submit that on any level, a person knows that this is wrong. Because everyone knows that he lives in reality and he has to deal with it. That he can't alter reality by pretense. That simply is A as A. So it can't be a mere error of knowledge to be dishonest, or to put the point another way. However ignorant you are, you cannot honestly be dishonest. Not to yourself. That would be a self-contradiction. Therefore, if a person is really dishonest, not just mistaken, I do hold that as a major moral charge against him. 
Here's a question from way back that's been deferred every week. Suppose a person's conscious conviction on a particular issue is in the form of a floating abstraction and therefore not fully understood. And he acts on an emotion that is in conflict with this conscious conviction. Is he being immoral? You get that? His abstraction is floating, but yes, that's his viewpoint, and then he acts against. I'd say it all depends on what is the content of his conviction and how real is it in his mind. Floating abstraction subsumes a tremendous number of degrees. If he sees in some terms, or should see in some terms, the issue, and then acts against it because of an emotion, you can't excuse him on the grounds that, well, it wasn't thoroughly concretized in his mind. For instance, a person may not be able to give a full philosophic defense of uh, productiveness. He can't give all the details. So to some extent, let's say, it's generalized in his mind. And then he feels like robbing a bank. He can't justify that on the grounds of, well, it's still vague in my mind. You see, that, he, to that extent, he sees enough, or he should see enough, that that becomes a charge against him. On the other hand, the guy who says, oh, you should live for others, and so on, has a general floating abstraction that he's never thought about, and then doesn't give to charity because he doesn't want to. He's got a floating abstraction and an emotion against it, and he acts on the emotion, and I say, OK. I, I think his emotion reflects a better understanding than his alleged conviction. And the point is, it's not, in fact, a conviction. It's just a floating generality, and that's the way he's always been brought up. So the charge, the question against him would be, what does he do when he finds out that there's an alternative generality? See? So as such, I would say you can't give an absolute answer. It depends on the context. Now, a question that came in in Lecture 10, which I want to read you, which has preyed on my mind, I must say, for two weeks. And I had to fear, what if I die and don't answer this question? <laughs> I'd like to read you this question. This was given at Lecture 10. According to today's lecture, number 10, an objectivist could find Ayn Rand's novels boring or unenjoyable. Have you had any experiences regarding this? Well, the formulation, I think, is bizarre on the face of it, because if it's an objectivist, Ayn Rand's novels are the perfect aesthetic expression of an objectivist philosophy and sense of life. So, the idea that an objectivist, that is someone who accepts that philosophy, uh, would find this boring or unenjoyable, I would regard as a direct self-contradiction. By that fact, whatever the person is, they're not an objectivist. But this question bothered me in a much broader way than simply this formulation. It bothered me because I took a calculated risk, which I'm being very frank to tell you now, uh, in giving this course. Uh, I de held off giving this course for a long time because I knew I would have to come out very strongly against rationalism and repression, etc., and that there were going to be, therefore, some people, no matter what I did or how I stood on my head, who were going to draw from it the conclusion that objectivism is therefore really subjectivism, that everything is a matter of opinion, that you should just go by your feelings, that the alternative to repression is just deuces wild, live it up, etc. I tried to cover that several times, but uh, somebody once said, a statement can be foolproof, but nothing can be damn foolproof. <laughs> <clears throat> and the implication that I see in this particular question, which haunted me, is the idea deriving from a statement out of context from Lecture 10 that all concretes are optional. Now, this person seems to have got this out of my lecture from the idea that philosophy defines principles and not concretes, and therefore seems to have got the idea, so long as you subscribe to the objectivist principles, it's completely optional what you have, what reactions you have to any concretes, because after all, concretes 
are the preserve of your private uh, reactions. Now, this would be fantastic if anybody draws this conclusion. And I would really feel sorry to have given the course if even one person thinks that that's what I said. I can't stop anybody from coming to that interpretation. I can just say it one more time. Principles are integrations of concrete. That's all they are. They are not platonic entities in another dimension. There are no two separate worlds. The world of principles dictated by reason and the world of concretes, which are optional. If that's true, there is no such thing as philosophy. It's completely to be thrown out. Absolutely. Who needs principles if they are not to be applied to concretes and applied objectively? Now, where does the issue of options on concretes come in? In only one type of case. That's all I talked about in this sort of judgment. And that is where the concrete in question is mixed. Where there's a good element and a bad element. Then I think you have the obligation to identify both elements. I mean, you still can't be blind and say, well, since I like the good element, I'm going to pretend the bad doesn't exist, or vice versa. You have an obligation, if you're to be objective, to identify the two elements. And then, however, within limits, I think it's optional, which you prefer. Whether the good outweighs in your, to, in your experience or the bad. Even here, however, you have an, if you're going to make your viewpoint public, if you're going to write it down, for instance, or give a lecture or whichever, you have an obligation in the name of objectivity to identify the actual elements that are there, to name your own personal option, and to be clear that this is not binding on others, and may not even be of any interest to others. There are many things that I like that I would never dream of even talking about to anybody because I don't think they're of any interest to other people. I know that it's a subjective association or personal association. Uh, and it would not be of any interest. It's not, it's not an, an objective thing. You have to be able to identify the elements and then recognize what's the status of your option. And as I say, all of this applies where the concrete in question is, in fact, mixed. But there are a lot of concretes that are not mixed, whether for good or for evil. And I would say in those cases, if you can demonstrate it, there is no option. And if a person likes the, the bad, the thoroughly, unmitigatedly bad, he simply is wrong, flatly wrong, regardless of his upbringing, his preferences, his choices, etc., and vice versa for the good. Now, if somebody said about Adolf Hitler, for instance, well, he did a lot of wicked things, but on the other hand, he has a really cute mustache. <laughs> now, my personal option, I love that kind of mustache. So I feel kind of sympathy and warm feeling for him. That's my option. I say that is not legitimate. It is not legitimate because you are defying the essence of the concrete in that case. You are making a gross irrelevancy into a criterion even of your optional judgment. And that is completely defying reality. Now, with all due respect, I maintain that in the realm of aesthetic judgment, Ayn Rand's works are to the good what Hitler is to the evil. In other words, she has a rational philosophy, in my judgment, for the first time in history brilliantly dramatized in matchless works of fiction, completely consistent from sense of life, characterizations, plot, etc. Uh, I do not see any legitimate ground on which anyone could say, I find this quote boring or unenjoyable. I do not regard that as a legitimate option. I think anybody who says that is simply wrong. And I would argue for that on the same exact principles as I would argue in reverse about Adolf Hitler. Although I'm here relating incommensurates, that is a, a, an artwork and a person. But it's the point I involved is the principles and their application to the concrete in both cases, in my judgment, are so unmistakable that I do not regard that as a realm of option. Now. It's a different question. What 
would I think of a person if uh, they didn't like uh, her works? Granted, I don't think the judgment is legitimate. Does it follow that I would say this person is depraved? Not necessarily. It altogether depends on why. Now, in general, I have to tell you, if someone really does not like her works, I have no further interest in that person. To me, that person is just, of all the possibilities life holds to explore, that does not, is not included because it is such a thorough embodiment, everything that matters to me, that if someone can read that and say, I don't like it, that's, they may as well tell me we are just the opposite on everything, so there's no use, from my point of view, pursuing it. But uh, I can imagine, and I'm here bending over backwards to be fair and honest, instances where I would not condemn such a person, where I would not hold it against them, even though I think it's a mistake. For instance, I've met people, and sometimes nice people, who say, well, I like her works, but I can't read the speeches. They're just so long. Now, I think this is a mistake. I think you could demonstrate that those speeches are even shorter than they have to be, and that they're necessary to the plot, that they simply can't be condensed. But to me, it's graspable that someone on a certain level is just not that interested in ideas, and that does not prove depravity. I can think of an even more plausible case where I will let the person off the hook altogether. I mean, I wouldn't care to you know, relate to them very much, but I certainly wouldn't regard them as guilty. And that is, I've seen several generations now of objectivists. And I've seen objectivist parents drive their kids crazy with objectivist dogmatism. <laughs> they hammer it down the throat of these kids for 15 years. Every time the kid just wants a Coke, he gets a lecture on ASA. And after a while, the kid just rebels in the name of human self-assertion, and for the rest of his life, he hates uh, Ayn Rand and objectivism as the thing which destroyed his childhood. Now, <laughs> this to me is a very understandable reaction, and I, I know particular children who grew up this way who will never endorse objectivism, who don't have the objective capacity to realize there was a warped attitude on the part of their parents, but nevertheless, that's the situation as they see it. Uh, I'm not going to here go into every possibility. I simply want to cut this short by saying this. The moral of my talk on options was not that everything is an option. When you say that something is an option, you have to be able to show in the actual concrete what are the good, what are the bad. They have to be balanced enough so it's not like the Hitler mustache case. You have to be able to identify both including the principles that you're using to make the comparison. I, I just do not literally know what else to say to prevent the whole objectivist movement from turning in the direction of empiricism and subjectivism as a reaction to rationalism. To me, this, frankly, this is insoluble. I, I don't know how this issue can be communicated so that people will not draw one extreme from the other. So I, I have to confess to you failure. I have not found a way to prevent this, and my only recourse, therefore, is the useless one of constant reiteration. But constant reiteration passes by the people who already understand uh, the issue and the ones who aren't, aren't going to understand. So it's self-defeating, so I better stop. That's my last attempt. Uh, it's easy for you to dismiss outright the libertarian biographies of Ayn Rand because you knew her so closely. And the person goes on, but there's no other sources of such information. Maybe it would be useful if you could comment at, at length on at least one of these books so we can know which facts are true and which is misrepresentation. Ayn Rand is very dear to us as a great person, not only as an author. Well, I would regard commenting on these books that are forthcoming, and of which I know, are really as an issue of the sanction of evil. And I would not do it. I know the authors in some cases. These books are got willful falsehoods, motivated by malice, mixed into the text. And I simply would not 
ever make a comment on a book that I know is of that nature. I appreciate the interest in Ayn Rand's biography, and I certainly do intend to authorize a biography where I believe that it will be done objectively uh, and not, by, uh, not for any reason of personal malice. And in that case, uh, when that happens, I will certainly open up all of her papers, etc., to such a biographer. But I can tell you that I'm speaking now in December of 1983. I have not done that. And I will not, not now nor ever have a comment on some of the forthcoming biographies uh, uh, for the reason that I mentioned. I would consider it immoral on my part to comment, to even get to the point of distinguishing this page was true and this page was false on exactly the grounds that I would not take some uh, libel from the Nazi party against the Jews and say, well, now, on page 34, maybe he made a good point, but the first 12 pages are dishonest. In its inception and by its method, it's corrupt. And the same thing uh, exactly in these cases. Um, is it possible, we're coming to the end, is it possible to vote for a non-objectivist candidate in a presidential election without compromise? Absolutely. Uh, this person is obviously not familiar with Ayn Rand's political writing, but for instance, she endorsed Goldwater, and she, uh, that was long ago, she endorsed Gerald Ford and voted for him, and the principles involved in that she covers in the Ayn Rand letter and the objectivist newsletter. Why don't you like to talk about philosophy at parties? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it's very hard work. It's a, uh, for me, it, it takes a tremendous tension of mind, because I'm usually asked questions. And people come up and they say, what about such and such? And I have to retain the seven main terms they're using and all the possible interpretations and misinterpretations and implications and it's like being a controller, you know, for the airplanes coming in with all the blips. <laughs> it's a tremendous degree of concentration. And why, do, why should I do that at a party? I do that all day. I mean, uh, sometimes in a relaxed context with a very few people who know the subject, it can be fun. But uh, it's like performing brain surgery. And I, I really don't see, since I don't go to that many parties, to do the same thing at night that I do all day. That doesn't mean you shouldn't. You may have a different background and profession, you may really enjoy it, or maybe it's not as much work. <coughs> <laughs> Why wasn't Eddie Willers taken to Atlantis? Well, that was deliberate on Ms. Rand's part. Eddie Willers was supposed to symbolize the average man. And the idea was to be the creative genius can survive on their own. They're the type that form Atlantis or start new civilizations. But the average man is at the mercy of chance. If he happens to come under the wing of the creative genius, he can be a success, etc. If not, he falls by the wayside. He himself can't be the generator of his long-range uh, position. And the idea of leaving him stranded was specifically to illustrate he's not necessarily doomed, but he's not necessarily saved. Wesley Mouch is doomed by his essence. John Gall is saved by his essence. Eddie Willers, is, um, is, it's up to chance what finally happens. And that's why she left him stranded in the wilderness. If somebody comes by, OK, and if not, no. Um, you seem to suggest that a woman has to choose between a career as a mother and a career outside the home. I want both, and I believe I can devote myself to both of that. Absolutely, it's a complete misinterpretation. I don't see why you can't be a mother and a career woman, assuming the career is not 17 hours a day. And the same is true for a father in a career. So there's no intrinsic conflict except in certain unique careers. Or if you have eight kids. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Trying to get down to the last few here. Well, does a parent have the moral right to impose a religious attitude or philosophy on an adolescent? Or is it better to let a child chew on various religious philosophies and reach their own conclusions? To tell you briefly, I think a parent has an obligation to teach a child whatever he knows or believes honestly to be true philosophically. It's an abdication of your parental responsibility if you evade issues which you know, where you know the truth, and you think it's crucial, whether this is ethics or metaphysics or whatever the topic has to be, including the uh, existence of God. It's a primary responsibility of a parent to educate the child. And this idea that, well, I don't want to impose my view, I'll just let him grow up with no view, and then uh, when he's 19, he'll decide is ludicrous, because it simply means he grows up with the conventional view that you yourself, as a parent, never challenge. He just absorbs from his schoolmates and teachers, etc. It simply is complete uh, abdication. So certainly, he has not only the right, but the duty to, quote, impose his view. But by impose, I don't mean it in the uh, sense of forcing it down his throat, but certainly telling him at the point that you think it's appropriate what you believe and why, what your reasons are. And then a follow-up to this from another person. How do I bring up a child in an atheistic household without causing him psychological problems dealing with his classmates? Well, you think you have to explain simply, and I know many parents who do this, that uh, the belief in God is a fairy tale, like Santa Claus, and that some of his classmates still believe in it, but he, you don't. That's it. It, it, you would cause psychological problems if you tell the child, Johnny next door is the repository of the evil and irrationality <laughs> of the last two millennia. You are alone with the, well, you're lucky to have a rational mother like me because the whole world is depraved. <laughs> but it can be done in a perfectly common sense, untraumatic way. The kids at eight and 10 couldn't care less whether their neighbors do or don't believe in God. Uh, that's an adult uh, issue that doesn't mean a thing. Can I go on just a couple of minutes? I don't want to make the bartender wait, but just a couple of minutes. Could you comment on the appropriateness of listening to a concert held in a church? Absolutely appropriate. That's presumably the idea that that's a sanction of evil. I mean, I, I can only think that's why the question would be asked. No, it depends entirely on the purpose of the concert. If it's a concert to raise funds for the Soviet Union, I wouldn't go to it wherever it's held. But why in the world would you not go to a church uh, to listen to a concert? I mean, I've gone to churches to hear religious concerts, such as mass on Christmas, etc. So. There's no implication if you step foot, you know. <laughs> In fact, I've had nuns take my courses on objectivism. And I don't think that the fact that they're sitting there, nor did they think that the fact that they're sitting there besmirches them eternally with the radiations of objectivism. <laughs> uh, I'm going to come down to the last few questions here. <sighs> Too long. What? On that last question, yeah. Absolutely. It's all right to pay money to see a concert. It depends what the, what you're talking about. But even if you have to pay an admission price to a church, that doesn't prove anything. You are not there by fostering religion. The money is probably going to the musicians. Or even if it's going to the church, it's, it's too insignificant. If you just look up the world holdings of the Catholic Church, <laughs> nothing has changed in terms of their you know, power in the world by the 50 cents or a dollar. And you know, there might be good elements in a certain religion. You can't equate religion with communism. It's not, it's not exactly a parallel. Because a religion is an entire view of life. 
the person can still believe in respect for the individual's rights, and it's a philosophic disagreement which doesn't necessarily come down to your sanctioning slaughter. So you can't equate giving money to a church service with, with giving money to the Communist Party. There's a couple of last quick ones. Um, all right, let's say three last ones. <laughs> two, that's too long. Uh, <clears throat> what about Miss Rand's view of pain, guilt, and fear? Didn't she see them as fundamentally unimportant, and doesn't that lead to de-emphasizing those emotions and therefore to repression? Absolutely not. She regarded them as unimportant metaphysically. In other words, pain and fear and guilt should not be the indication of the essential nature of life or of the universe. But that is an intellectual, philosophic appraisal. Repression would have to be it's wrong to feel those emotions at any time, in any context, and therefore you should never feel them. And that's ridiculous, as I've tried to say. To say that something is not a reflection of the essential nature of reality, is not to say, therefore, it's wrong ever to feel it, including to feel it very, very intensely and for a long period of time, relatively speaking. And the last question I can get in. I'm impressed with the turnout for your course. However, in general, all I see in the world is a negative response to the ideas you propose. In your experiences, do you see any trend that indicates that objectivist views are more accepted now especially in the intellectual sphere? No, I don't, to be perfectly frank. I could point out to you what I regard as hopeful signs. There's a lot of young graduate students uh, in the humanities of a, a very reasonably high caliber, which I think is encouraging. Ayn Rand's sales continue to bedazzle her publishers, who can't account for it. <laughs> There's a tremendous interest in all of her properties for the movies. Uh, there are three different movie projects right now in various stages of talking. Whether they'll materialize, I don't know, but that includes Anthem, We the Living, and Atlas. Uh, my courses are running now in well over 100 cities. So there is signs, definitely. But if this question, I mean, good signs, but if this question is, in the intellectual world, in terms of entrenched professors in university courses, I do not see uh, any more hopeful signs, and I don't know how long it will be. Not until there's a real penetration of the universities will there be a turnaround. And they are, in my experience right now, really closed and hostile. So I'd like to end on a joyously uplifted note. So all I can say is, you know what uh, Kira and Leo said, perhaps someday abroad, but not right now. Thank you very much. Yeah.